Hello, welcome to the India story. I'm Vikram Chandra. And today on the show, we unfold a chapter of history and significance in Ayodhya, the much anticipated grand opening of the Ram Temple on January the 22nd. Marks a moment that's been anticipated for quite some time. And as Ayodhya transforms, we explore its deep rooted history and also the controversies that have shaped this sacred town with two very special guests, renowned author Amish Tripathi and French journalist Francois Gauthier. Also on the show, we turn to the rising concern of deep fakes where manipulated videos spread misinformation on social media. Our guest, cybercrime investigator Ritesh Bhatia, will shed light on this worrying trend and what we can do to fight it. And also on the show, former ambassador to Iran, D.P. Shivasa, will join us to examine the geopolitical implications of the recent escalating tensions between Iran and Pakistan with strikes happening in both directions. What does it all mean for India? But before we look at any of those special stories, let's quickly take you through all the major headlines that you should be tracking this week. External Affairs Minister S. Jai Shankar met his Maldivian counterpart Musa Zamir on January 18th amid a diplomatic standoff between India and Maldives. The duo met in Uganda on the sidelines of the NAM summit. Jai Shankar tweeted that the two sides held a frank conversation on ties between the two countries. At least two previously unknown incidents of skirmishes between the Indian and Chinese troops along the line of actual control following the Galwan clash have come to light. This was revealed after the Indian Army made citations mentioning them while conferring gallantry awards on its personnel. According to PTI, the Army's Western Command had uploaded a video of the January 13th ceremony on its YouTube channel but deactivated it later. The incidents mentioned in the citations had taken place between September 2021 and November 2022. A monitoring committee appointed by the Supreme Court to look into the Bhopal gas tragedy has flagged glaring inefficiencies in the aid provided to the victims over the years. The panel raised several red flags before the Madhya Pradesh High Court, which has started contempt proceedings against three senior state officials. The committee revealed that the medical records and gas relief hospitals were not digitized. The panel also flagged vacant posts in the hospitals run by the Bhopal Gas Tragedy Relief and Rehabilitation Department. And let's turn now to our top story. The Ram Mandir in Ayodhya is almost complete and the grand opening is set for the 22nd of January. The temple town is undergoing a transformation with a new airport, hotels, railway station and other facilities. This is of course a temple town with a checkered history History is somewhat centered around a dispute bitterly fought for decades by Hindus and Muslims over the Ram Temple in that particular spot. Now, what, what's the background to all of this, especially for those of you watching in other parts of the world? Now, Ayodhya is a city on the banks of the Saryu River in the northern Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. Hindus believe it to be the birthplace of one of their most revered gods, Lord Ram. The Rao centered for a long period of time over the 16th century Babri Mosque, which many Hindus allege was built by Muslim invaders after demolishing a Hindu temple, a Hindu temple that marked Lord Ram's birthplace. So let me just recap in brief the, the history behind all of this. In 1949, a group of Hindus placed idols of Ram Lala or infant Lord Ram under a central dome at the disputed structure, leading to long-drawn tensions between the two communities. In the early 1990s, politics around the temple gathered steam and leaders from the BJP in particular began mobilizing Hindus from across the country and a demand for a temple to be built where the mosque stood. In 1992, a Hindu mob demolished what was called the Babri Masjid or the Babri Mosque, which led to riots in the country where nearly 2,000 people were killed. In 2010, the Allahabad High Court ruled that the site should be split into three, Hindus, Muslims and the Nirmohi Akhara, which was one of the early litigants in the case, all getting a share of that particular site. 
This ruling was then suspended by the Supreme Court. And the final act in 2019, the Supreme Court unanimously ruled that the disputed land should be given to the Hindus to construct a Ram temple out there, while offering Muslims another plot of land to build a mosque. It also directed the government to set up a trust to manage and oversee the construction of the temple. The Supreme Court did, however, also say that the demolition of the mosque in 1992 was against the law. And this, essentially, this ruling is what has led then to the construction of this Ram Temple, where the grand inauguration is going to be on the 22nd of January. In 2020, amidst the pandemic, Prime Minister Narendra Modi laid the foundation for the construction of the new temple. The 1800 crore rupee temple project is expected to be one of the grandest monuments of Hinduism and it is going to be inaugurated with the Pran Pratishtha or a consecration ceremony of Ram Lala's idol and that is what is scheduled to take place on January the 22nd and you can expect considerable attention lots of people are going to be going there not just on the 22nd of january but immediately after that a lot of attention has been brewing around this and of course there's been some political controversy itself so what does the inauguration of the ram temple mean from a civilizational point of view a religious point of view a cultural point of view a tourism point of view and of course the political point of view two very special guests joining us francois gauthier and also amish tripathi let me start with you amish you of course author of several of india's biggest blockbusters one of india's best known uh, authors also someone who wrote the Ram Chandra series uh, and therefore know everything about the history of Ayodhya and the Ram temple. So, Amish, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, what is your perspective on this, uh, on, on the inauguration of the Ram temple? Uh, what do you think some of the key significances and the implications of this are going to be? I think what is happening can be seen at, at various uh, levels. One and the, perhaps the most prosaic level is the economic impact uh, it will have. Um, Ayodhya has been transformed. The infrastructure that has emerged, uh, the number of uh, pilgrims and tourists that will come, just to give you a perspective, Goa with decades of uh, marketing behind it uh, gets maybe, I think around, if my numbers aren't wrong, 80, 90 lakh uh, tourists per year. Uh, Kashi, when the Kashi Vishwanath Dham was expanded, Straight away shot up to 3-4 crore uh, tourists and pilgrims per year. Ayodhya this year is expected to be anywhere between 7.5 to 8 crores. You can imagine the massive economic impact that will have on a region that used to be very poor. Infrastructure has been transformed in every way. So that's of course the economic impact. Another way to see it is actually uh, the strengthening of uh, national consciousness. Uh, there's this brilliant author uh, and scholar called Dinah Eck, an American, uh, who would written this book called uh, Sacred Geography. I read it many, many years back. And she'd made this very insightful point in that book. I'm paraphrasing a bit, but uh, broadly the point is the same, that India was not built on the power of its kings. It was built on the footsteps of its pilgrims. The Indians from across the Indian subcontinent went to different regions, particularly to the major temples. And that's where the national consciousness would get built. Ayodhya will be such a place. Indians from across the subcontinent, and I'm not just saying just from India, but Nepal, Bhutan, from Bangladesh, from whatever Hindus survive in Pakistan, many of them will come. Uh, and this will build a consciousness, uh, a consciousness of togetherness, which will be a massive impact. And the third thing is, of course, at a religious level, you can see the outpouring and the immense devotion across uh, the land. And at a civilizational level, this has almost never happened in history, that a pagan idol worshipping culture, uh, because the movement has been broadly one way, pagan idol worshipping cultures just get wiped out and they keep uh, retreating. It's a civilizational move. 
Now, Amish, a lot of people who are going to be watching this inauguration around the world are going to be thinking back to the 6th of December 1992, the demolition of the Babri Masjid, the disputed structure that, stu uh, that stood on this particular point, and they'll be viewing this as, a, as a, another step towards majoritarianism. Uh, that, at least, is the reaction that we're getting from many, many parts of the world and, of course, many parts of India as well. Now, of course, the Supreme Court has come out and given that verdict in 2019, which does in a, set, in a sense set a judicial seal on everything that is happening in Ayodhya right now. What would you be saying about this and how would you be interpreting this for people watching in other parts of the world? No, uh, I think even the Supreme Court uh, held that what happened on uh, 6 December 1992 was a crime and a, you know, and uh, investigation court cases on that are ongoing. But uh, I think the most uh, uh, significant part in this is the process that happened post that, the process of actually how the temple came into being. That happened through a very long, laborious court process, uh, through evidence, uh, through truth-seeking, through debates in a court of law. Uh, I'm making a documentary, Vikram, on this, and it should release uh, very soon on the story of the temple itself. And uh, uh, it's a story of the temple from the beginning till now, from the birth of Lord Ram till now. But a reasonable part of it is actually on the court case uh, itself. Uh, and we interviewed Chief Justice Bobre as well, and he said rightly that this is, in a way, a role model uh, for because such disputes are there across the world. I'm, I'm sure you've heard of Hagia Sophia, uh, which was converted into a mosque, but was actually a church. And uh, the Pope had made a uh, statement on that when it was converted. And in fact, actually, most people forget 1600 years ago, before it was a church, it was actually a, a, a pagan temple uh, to, to the goddess. But of course, there are no pagans around in Turkey, so there's no one who remembers that. But there are a lot of Christians. And this was just converted by a stroke of the pen of the administrator. There was no... Uh, evidence gathering, court, a process of debate, in a sense, which works like a truth and reconciliation commission. And that's what happened in this case. There was a long court case where all evidence was presented. It was proved beyond a shadow of doubt that there was actually a temple under there and that it was indeed a temple dedicated to Lord Ram. Uh, and this was proved uh, in the court and hence this case happened. So Chief Justice Bobe said this can be actually a role model for how to settle such disputes not through uh, force, but through evidence gathering and court, which leaves, uh, there's no winner or loser in this thing. Everyone kind of accepts it. And the evidence of this is in a fact like, for example, Iqbal Saab, who's one of the litigants from the Muslim side. Uh, and he himself, you know, made a statement that he wants to attend the, you know, and see the, and uh, do a darshan of Lord Ram. Uh, very recently, I'm sure you must have read that. Why did he do that? I think it's because he actually saw the evidence as well. There were many Muslims who in the 80s had said, prove to us that there was a temple and we ourselves will, will give it. Uh, and the proof emerged in this uh, court. So, Amish, what you're saying is that whatever happened on the 6th of December 1992 was wrong. It was a wrong action. But the process that followed later, the judicial process in particular, has eventually given legitimacy to the construction of the Ram Mandir and the inauguration that we're going to see on the 22nd of January. Is that what you're saying? The evidence of that is in the fact that one of the litigants himself wants to come to the temple. You know, in our documentary, we had uh, one of the uh, people we interviewed was K.K. Mohammed Saab, who's... Uh, who's one of the legendary archaeologists uh, in India, and he's a Muslim. Uh, and uh, he himself spoke of the evidence. And his work, by the way, went into the evidence, right? Uh, and he himself spoke of the evidence that there was a temple there, the evidence shows it. Uh, and then he said something very uh, uh, interesting and intriguing. He said, look, uh, I'm an Indian Muslim. Babar and Mir Baki were foreigners. They were from what is today's Uzbekistan. He said, what do I have to do with it? You know? Uh, right. And he said something very interesting. This is not a Hindu-Muslim issue. This is an Indian foreigner issue. And it was a foreign invader who came and did a crime on, on India. And this was said, like I said, by, a, by an Indian Muslim and a legendary archaeologist whose work actually went into the court case to prove that there was indeed a temple there.
All right, Amish, you've spoken about many of the possible impacts of this. You've looked at it from a religious point of view, civilizational point of view. Now, there is, of course, also the political angle which is playing itself out, the controversy about whether the opposition should be there or not, and the big question of how it will potentially affect the general election of 2024. Uh, do you have a take on that as well? Uh, Kram, on politics, I always say there are many far, far wiser than I am uh, who yeah. comment on this every night. And as I always joke, some of them on TV channels, they comment so loudly, you can hear them even if you switch the TV set off. So <laughs> it might be best to listen to them on politics, not me. <laughs> All right, fair enough. We'll come back to the politics it was a little later. So let me return to the civilizational and the religious aspects. Do you see with the Ram Mandir at Ayodhya, you know, there's never actually been a single central place for Hinduism. The, the sort of Hinduism doesn't have a Mecca Medina. Hinduism doesn't have a Vatican City. Do you think one of the things that could emerge after all the development that we are seeing in Ayodhya, the construction of the Ram Temple, also uh, the tourism potential in Ayodhya itself, do you see the Ram Mandir perhaps becomes that, that central point for Hinduism, you know, for Hindus to go to congregate, the main pilgrimage spot for, 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 for Hindus? If you're saying that 100 million people are going there, you know, uh, 100 million people isn't a small number. If that many people are going to go to Ayodhya every single year, a lot of people coming. So do you see Ayodhya taking that particular position for Hindus? And is that part of what we are seeing now unfolding? I think the fact that we have so many it gives us, in a sense, uh, a liberal Catholic spirit, not Catholic in terms of the religion, but Catholic in terms of looking at where, you know, where is different yeah. approaches. Because remember, different gods and goddesses are worshipped, you know, at every place. Kamakya Ji is the goddess, right? So that's one aspect that gives a liberal bent. Secondly, it also, you know, Vikram, you understand IT, right? And the most critical thing in IT is a backup. Yeah. And perhaps that's one of the reasons we survived the invasions of the last thousand years, because there was no one place which an invader could destroy, which would, you know, destroy the religion. We had backups everywhere. So I, so honestly, other places I will remain important. important, but everyone else, if the other major ones will also continue to be important. All right. No one central space is what you are saying, Amesh. Well, I'm sure you must be very keen to go there. What What is your own agenda? When are you going there? Uh, I, I will be there on the 22nd. Uh, but uh, what I'm genuinely looking forward to, because obviously security, everything will be so intense out there on the 22nd. Uh, I am really looking forward uh, to going back as an ordinary uh, uh, pilgrim post the 26th. I'm going to take my mother along. She really wants uh, to go out there. And uh, we'll want to go and pray out there. So for us, I mean, uh, you know, I'm a genuine devotee. So uh, uh, so I'm looking forward more to uh, going post the 26th with my family. All right, Amish, thank you so much uh, for joining us. So Amish, Amish Tepati, they're talking about some of the civilizational, the economic and the religious points of view. Let's get some other perspectives also. Francois Gauthier now joining us, correspondent uh, in South Asia. He writes rights from a, from a French weekly magazine, the author of a book, An Entirely New History of India. Somebody, uh, Francois, uh, talking about... Uh, cultural renaissance in India for a long uh, period of time. You've been an India observer for a very long uh, period. What is your take on the Ram Mandir that is now being inaugurated on the 22nd? How important an event do you think this is going to be? Well, as a defender of Hindus, because I have been known as a defender of Hindus for quite some time since I started covering Kashmir, um, I think it's great. I was there when the, uh, the Babri machine was brought down uh, by uh, Mr. Alvani and his car acts. And I thought that uh, at that time, um, it was an act of courage because it was a makeshift mosque, which was not, which was unused. And, and of course, Ayodhya is a very sacred place to Hindus. I know many Hindus, simple Hindus, gurus, who have said the same thing, you know, Ayodhya is very sacred for us. We need to reclaim it. So Mr. Modi did it, and I think uh, it was one of his uh, pledges that he had uh, when he was campaigning in his first term, and he did it, and that's good. I'm a little, you know, I'm a little disturbed by 
the autocracy that goes with it, the, the you know the the emperor-like uh, mantle that Mr. Modi is more and more seems to be, in spite of himself, uh, uh, you know, uh, endorsing and, and covering himself with. But uh, uh, I, I think it's you know it's good, it's good, it's it's a good thing, and Mr. Modi always surprises us. You know, by doing things that uh, we thought he would not do. Uh, so it's positive. It, it should be and remain positive. All right, Francois, let's just turn to some of the political aspects of this. There have been, of course, a lot of conversations or arguments, if you like, taking place about what the opposition is calling the political nature of uh, this inauguration. And that's why the Congress Party and other opposition parties are, are staying away. You've seen what some of the Shankaracharyas have actually said. What is your interpretation of these controversies? No, I'm not. I'm not in favor of uh, people who boycott Ayodhya because of caste. Or I'm not in. I, you know, I think that India needs to rise above caste. And uh, uh, I'm not in favor. I think that even the Congress should have you know, should have come because uh, it is something to celebrate and it's something that's inevitable. So why boycott it? You know why why boycott it? And the Congress itself has been known as a very opportunistic party, which plays into you know the minorities. So uh, I, I think it's wrong on the part of the Congress and of Mr. Raul Gandhi, for whom I have some respect uh, to have boycotted Ayodhya, because the majority of Hindus are going to be pleased about it, and uh, no doubt it's going to help Mr. Modi get re-elected uh, in 2024, this year in May, uh, which anyway he was going to be re-elected, but he's going to get a little more, you know, little more vote bank, uh, little, little uh, wider majority because of Ayodhya, but you can't blame it for that because he had said he would do it and you know the majority of hindus of india i would say you know 75 to 80% of hindus want it so you can't blame mr modi for taking advantage of that for electoral purpose so there i'm with him so francois you do look at the election process very closely do you think that after the inauguration of the ram temple it becomes all the more likely that narendra modi will be back as the prime minister uh, and with a with a thumping majority you do you do believe that this is something that is going to potentially be a major vote catcher when general elections are held a little later this year i mean i said you know, 40 30 years ago that the BG, the 21st century will be the century of the bgp and they will likely uh, stay in power most of this century. And I think this is going to happen. Um, of course, uh, as we said earlier, the autocratic turn that it is taking, uh, both at the hand of Mr. Modi and Mr. Amit Shah, is a little worrying for me as a defender of India, because I'm I'm foremost a defender of India. I think India is a great country with great people, whatever the, their religion, whatever their caste, you know. And there is a, something very unique about India. So. That worries me because in the long run, people of India, the people of India, we saw it with Indira Gandhi, they ultimately, you know, they have the power to reject someone or reject a party which they feel have abused power or, you know, taken more power than they should have. So the autocratic and the dictatorship-like turn that it is taking, the BGP is taking, where even within the BGP, nobody, no minister, no, no grassroots worker, no spokesperson is able to say aloud what he or she thinks. That worries me because I've been a defender of the BGP. I thought that, you know, Hindus are great people and the BGP is their party, so, so be it, let it be elected. And I've defended Mr. Modi also since 2002, since Godra, and I met him many times and I admire him and I respect him, but I think power, power corrupts, and the problem in Delhi is that there's immense power in Delhi. There is tremendous power in Delhi, and that this power has swallowed the BGP. The BGP, you know, we saw that Mr. Modi wanted to break the shackles of this BVVIP system in the beginning, you know, security, and you know, and, and, you know, and, and on this connection that you need a connection in Delhi to connect to ministers and connect to uh, to M MLAs or or. or uh, so, so Mr. Modi tried to break it, but ultimately he became a prisoner of this BVIP system, which the Congress has created. And that worries me because I think when he was in Gujarat, Mr. BGP met people, he could, he could get the pulse of the country. Now he can't. He has too many you know, levels of security, too many PS, PS, and the PMO has become you know, like, a, like a power center, the most, uh, one of the probably in the world, the, the most powerful uh, power center in the world. 
All right, Francois, we'll of course keep on discussing what happens in the, in the build-up to the elections as we get closer. What are your own personal plans? Are you, are you planning to head to Ayodhya at some point in the near future? Yes, of course. So I've been to Ayodhya many times, actually. I, 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 you know, it's a place that I, I like, and uh, I think that, uh, again, Mr. Modi is doing the right thing, and uh, we, wish him, we wish him well, and we wish India well, and we want India to become a superpower. And I think Mr. Modi is leading India to become a superpower. All right, Francois, thank you so much for joining us with that uh, perspective. All right, let me turn now to what the international press has been saying about India. And not surprisingly, the Ram Mandir features fairly prominently in that. Uh, the BBC, for example, one of those uh, outlets talking about how the uh, flashpoint holy city is being transformed into the Hindu Vatican. The BBC also talking about the political strategy behind all of this and the timing of this inauguration and how uh, the Ram Mandir has actually led the BJP to a prominent position in Indian uh, politics. So, so that and many other articles in the international press coming out on the Ram Mandir. Um, when you have an interesting article in Foreign Policy magazine talking about cross-border assassinations being an instrument of statecraft and uh, referring to the, its, its perception that India is a member of the Global Assassinations Club where other countries like you know Israel, Russia, the, the USA are members. Well, this at least is the perspective of foreign policy. Now, the New York Times had a very interesting front page story on something that we've often spoken about right here on the India story, which is the judicial backlogs that are there in India, uh, pointing to the fact that this is an area of concern with more than uh, 50 million criminal and civil cases pending, uh, pointing out that it could take 300 years to clear that entire docket at the present rate and uh, saying that this is an important area that needs to be fixed. And yes, that is uh, one, one ground on which we, we can actually completely agree with the New York Times. Uh, that judicial backlog needs to be cleaned up and cleaned up fast. Let's move on to another very major story that has been capturing a lot of attention, especially after a recent episode with Sachin Tendulkar. Deepfakes. Now, deepfakes are a worrying trend of manipulated videos that are spreading misinformation on social media. And that's our special focus this week. Cricketing legend Sachin Tendulkar was the latest victim. A morph video featuring him endorsing a gaming app was being circulated. Tendulkar took to social media to caution against what he called the rampant misuse of technology. But this is not an isolated incident. Top actors, industrialists and startup founders have also been targeted using the technology. Digitally altered images of Katrina, Kaif and Rashmika Mandana, for example, surfaced last year, portraying them in swimwear. A morphed video showed Alia Bhatt making obscene gestures. And most recently, a fake video had Priyanka Chopra promoting brands. Businessmen are also not immune. Veteran Ratan Tata, the Infosys founder Narayan Murthy and Zerudas Nitin Kamath have all reported deep fake videos. The manipulated clips featured them recommending investments. The tycoons have cautioned users against falling prey to the misinformation campaign. So, what is a deep fake? Well, it is essentially a form of synthetic media created using artificial intelligence. Bits of real images and real sound are stitched together and digitally altered to make them seem authentic. But the technology can also create convincing but entirely fictional photos and now videos from scratch. In other words, what is happening is AI models are taking real images, real videos, real audio and then creating entirely fake videos after being trained on those real videos and audios. So it's completely fake, created from scratch, and quite often you can't tell whether it is genuine or whether it is fake. Now, obviously, if this is harmless, it would be one thing, but these deep fakes are most often being used for malicious purposes. They're being used to spread misinformation. And going forward, it could be used to, for example, be spread misinformation on crucial political, financial and geopolitical matters. It could manipulate public perception. It certainly can tarnish people's reputation. We're already seeing that happening. It poses a significant threat to society. 
The government has taken note of this emerging threat. Just last month, the centre sent an advisory to all social media platforms. They've been asked to ensure that their users do not violate the IT rules. The regulations, in other words, put the onus on Facebook, on Instagram, on X and so on and so forth to flag or remove content that contains misinformation or deepfakes. They also have to report users who violate norms. The government argues that deepfake is AI-generated misinformation and hence is governed by the same laws as are guiding other misinformation. But in addition, the IT Minister Rajiv Chandrasekhar has said that the government will soon notify tighter rules to address deepfakes in particular. Well, to understand just how bad this problem is and what we can do about it, we've been joined by noted cyber expert Ritesh Bhatia. Ritesh, thank you so much for joining us. Just wanted to get your sense of this deep fake menace, which you know, seems to be getting worse. We've just seen it hit Sachin Tendulkar, who's the latest victim of it. How bad is it already? And it is going to get much worse, isn't it? Oh, yes. So firstly, such an honor being with you on Vikram. You know, you've been somebody I've been watching since childhood and it's such a such a really an honor to uh, be on the show with you. So, yes, uh, I think when the first uh, TEDx talk that I had given uh, way back in 2017, I'd mentioned about this when I spoke about the unheard, unseen and unknown crimes and people said it looks like it's coming straight out of some Black Mirror episode and uh, many people weren't ready to believe. So imagine today we are over here. It has become a reality uh, where we are talking about this and it's just going to get worse and why I'm saying worse because 2024 is the election year so I think I'm going to see a lot of it coming uh, coming up. So Ritesh, there are two or three immediate ways in which we are seeing deep fakes happening but uh, one of them for example we are seeing actors, sleaze, slightly sleazy images of them are being, being created then we are seeing fake ads, as in the Sachin Tendulkar case. Now, you're also pointing to uh, a, a somewhat dangerous possibility, which is politics. You could have deep fake statements being made by politicians that are not correct. Those statements, for example, hit just before an election and it is too late to counteract the, the impact of that. Let's say somebody says something really offensive in a deep fake video and it happens one day before voting or on election day. It could have a massive impact and we won't know what to do about it. Absolutely, because, you know, and this is uh, exactly what is my fear. So it is just not the images that we are talking about. Uh, you know, they, they used to be photoshopped earlier also. And, you know, in the in the hinterland of India, in the, in the uh, you know, how people would believe that the photoshopped image also, they would believe to be real. And then we started having certain like kind of uh, mimicry experts who would mimic the voices. But now we don't need any of these guys. We got, uh, you know, it's just not about the images. We have something like deep mutes. You have this particular person, a celeb or a not a celeb, you know, maybe even a politician, and you just want to make them mute. All it takes is just five seconds and thirty-three rupees. Exactly thirty-three rupees and five seconds, and you have a you have a complete nude image of that person, and you even can't say that no, this is not that person. At least in Photoshop, you can make out, you know, the skin color of the face and the skin color of the body is different. But over here, you just can't even make out everything is so pixel perfect is what I would say. Then, so this is with images. Then now we have audios. You name the audio, like I can get your audio or any of the anchors or anybody's audio online, you know, especially the ones who speak so much like anchors and celebs and politicians. I just need to download a 20 second or even a two minute, let's say to be on a safer side, two minute audio. And I'm just able to clone the voice. And here I just have, I just go onto the website, say text to speech. I type my text, let's say in Hindi, English, Tamil, whatever language you want. And the speech will be like uh, of that particular person. So now I can make any celeb say anything for or against anything. And the interesting aspect of this, Ritesh, is that on the other side, somebody may have actually done something wrong or said something wrong. It could be a crime, for example, that the authorities have a recording on. How will that evidence ever be trusted? Because somebody can just pop up and say, like they do right now, say my account got hacked. They can just pop up and say, oh, this wasn't actually me. It's a deep fake. Exactly. And uh, if you would have seen in the past one year, many people have been using that as an excuse. You know, whenever there, there is a particular video being circulated, which is actually of theirs, and uh, 
you know, so they say, no, this is not mine. It's a deep fake. Even earlier, they would say that, that, you know, no, this statement has been, you know, misinterpreted. But now they are yeah, they just directly... Say, yeah, and that's what I was just saying. People already say, my account hack ho gaya, so now they'll do that with deep fakes. My account hack ho gaya. Or abhi to unke le, now they have something as simple as that. No, this is a deep fake. This is a voice deep fake. This is a, like a deep mute. They can say anything. Okay, Ritesh, the billion dollar question, how can you tell? How can you tell that this is a deep fake and this is not? And so if you have to ask me, what do we need to do? I have always been saying the one thing, like right now, what's trending on Instagram? The P-O-V. But here the P says, practice the pause. Just pause. Don't react with whatever you, you see. The, the O, I would say, please replace it with the zero. Zero trust. Whatever video you get, okay? So maybe let's say this video of ours, you and I talking, I would even tell my friends, don't believe that I'm actually talking to Vikram or you're actually seeing Ritesh, but it could be a deep fake of Ritesh, okay? So go with zero trust, that I don't believe anything. And when you say that, you will go to the third tool, which is the V, which is the verify. You'll actually want to verify what it is. For example, in the case of Amol, which came up with a particular ad, you know, that uh, Sharam, you know, they called the cheese thing which was created by a uh, with by ai people started believe because it was of a, such an awesome quality the imaging but you know we had to literally go onto the amul website find out whether it is there or not and then we came to know okay this was a prank and this was not even a prank somebody had done it it was an ai generated so whatever you read whatever you see and whatever you hear the first thing is pause don't forward and look at it with zero trust go verify and then react so frankly ritesh if you can't tell whether something is fake or something is not fake then at the end of the day very soon it is going to boil down to trusting the source from which you are receiving a particular video or a piece of information i have a feeling there will be fake videos and genuine videos you will not be able to tell the difference uh, between one and the other so eventually it will just come down to trusting person who is sending that particular information to you. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. And I think that is where uh, there is a positive thing that has also happened in the past two years that we have now more and more online journalists, like the digital journal, uh, the journalism has gone from the conventional method to the, you know, the digital method. And thanks to people like you, companies like you, that we are, at, we are still now getting something that's like really authentic. And that's why when you see things coming from a, this particular source or these sources and all, at least we can trust, okay, we know this is from, let's say, this channel or this is from this channel and we have trust in that particular channel or on this online platform. Earlier, it was just restricted to few mainstream channels and print. But now we can say, okay, if it is coming from here, this has to be authentic. Yeah, Ritesh, I couldn't agree with you more. I've been saying it for a while, frankly, that there used to be a time when content was king but content is going to be ubiquitous and it's going to be so good you can't tell this is genuine this is fake this is true this is false so perhaps in the era that we are now approaching curation is going to be the king not content that's that's only that's perhaps the only solution absolutely and till that time i would um, repeat the three apps that you need to download in your head that's practice the pause zero trust don't trust anything and then verify so, and especially in whatever now you are going to get it, because you would also be falling prey to cyber crimes. The AI based cyber crimes are already at their, you know, they're already there and they're happening in India. Uh, one thing I, I don't know if I have that time, I would just want to emphasize on the grandparent scam, which is going to boom quite a lot. Wherein imagine, Vikram, like, you know, our kids calling our parents and crying and saying that I've met with an accident and they are like blood soaked. It's their video and the grandfather, like, you know, my father is 74. He would, of course, say, okay, tell me where I have to give the money. And he'll give the money because the parents are all, all the time putting, I'm here, I'm here, and I'm there. And the hackers are going to, or the cyber criminals are going to take advantage of it. Grandparents will happily, like, give away 5 lakhs, 10 lakhs, thinking that they are paying it to the hospital, but this is what is going to happen. And this is already happening, and this is, has happened even in India. So this is the power of the misuse of the AI. Which I is, completely which agree with you. So, are adapting faster than us. 
Yeah, that's something else to worry about. So final advice to anybody watching this. If you are a parent, don't share too much of your children on social media. I can't say it often enough. Be careful. You may think you're posting a cute video or a cute image, but people can use that. They can train AI models on it and they can misuse these things more than you can imagine. Thank you so much, Ritesh, for joining us. Some really excellent advice that I hope everyone is going to pay attention to. And we're going to keep talking about this issue, I fear, in the weeks and months ahead. And let's turn our attention now to those escalating tensions between Iran and Pakistan. Both countries carrying out strikes in each other's territory. Strikes that they say are aimed at terrorist groups, but clearly it's an almost unprecedented event that is taking place. I mean, let's face it, Pakistan does have a history of fighting with virtually all of its neighbors. Um, sheltering terrorists and therefore having surgical strikes from India, sheltering terrorists and having hostilities with Afghanistan, this was known. But the fact that Iran would also get involved in it and you would actually have Iran carrying out strikes in Pakistan and then Pakistan responding with strikes, this is something you may not necessarily have expected uh, even just a couple of months back and especially so because both Iran and Pakistan are close strategic partners of China. Now what actually happened? It all started when Irani forces uh, targeted a militant camp in Pakistan's Balochistan province on Tuesday. Islamabad said that two children were killed in the strike. Tehran declared the attack was aimed at the Jaish al Adil, a group that has claimed responsibility for several attacks on Iranian soil. Tehran also launched attacks in Iraq and Syria at the same time against what it called anti-Iranian terrorist groups. But Pakistan reacted quite strongly. Islamabad condemned what it called an unprovoked violation of its airspace and it warned of serious consequences. And on Thursday, Pakistan hit several Iranian targets in retaliatory strikes, Islamabad calling it coordinated precision military strikes against alleged terror hideouts in the Sistan Balochistan province. Tehran said that nine people died, including four children. Pakistan claimed it was just acting on credible intelligence of impending large-scale terror activities. It has now appealed to Tehran to exercise restraint. Now, you get the picture. Both sides carrying out attacks. Both sides say that they are targeting terrorists. And both sides referring to brotherly and cordial relations with each other and uh, are saying that we don't really want to escalate this any further. This has been followed by a series of countries from China to the US to others, all calling for restraint. The United Nations has called for restraint and we'll have to see how matters are actually going to play out. So what is the Indian perspective on all of this? How should India react or not react? Who better to talk to uh, about this than Mr. D.P. Shivasav, who was the Indian ambassador to Iran at a particularly critical period when Chabahar was being negotiated. Mr. Mr. Shivasav, you're the real expert out here. What do you make of this sudden escalation? You know, Iran striking Pakistan, Pakistan striking Iran. Where do you see this headed? Let me start by saying, that the escalation did not start with the Iranian action on 17 January. There's a long background. Let me just take you back a month ago on 15th of December. A, a terror strike on a police station in Iran in the same province resulted in killing of 15 um, Iranian uh, policemen. This incident was claimed by Jaysh Adil which uh, is based in Pakistan, and the UN Security Council issued a strong statement condemning it and asking all concerned to take action to bring the perpetrators to justice. Nothing was done by Pakistan. Now, this was just latest in a series of accidents, uh, incidents. I recall there was has been horrendous killings of Shias, and these are not simply Iranian citizens. Pakistani Shias, who this is a land route between Pakistan and Iran, which goes to a Shia holy place called Mashhad. So Shia pilgrims from Pakistan used this land route and they were killed by Sunni extremist groups based in Pakistan. And on one such, after one such uh, large incident, in fact, uh, Iran 
parliament majlis adopted a strong resolution against Pakistan and Iran has also lost a formal complaint with the United Nations. So there's a long history of violence in this area uh, which has resulted from a uh, state policy. Pakistan has used Islamic fundamentalism to curb Baloch nationalism and they have brought Sunni extremist groups from Punjab, groups like Sepahe Sahaba to Balochistan. You would also recall that after 9-11, the Taliban or the Al-Qaeda leadership headed by Mullah Umar, they shifted to Quetta. Quetta yeah. It was Quetta Shura which ran their affairs till about 2013. So this could not have been possible without the patronage or at least complicity of uh, deep state in Pakistan. You know, Ambassador Shivatsa was actually quite interesting to look at this from an Indian point of view because when you look at it from an Indian point of view, this is exactly what India has been accusing Pakistan of for, what, 30 years, you know, shielding terrorists who are targeting India. Afghanistan has been saying that Pakistan is shielding anti-Afghan terrorists. Now, Iran is saying the same thing. It's also interesting to note that all of these countries have at some point gone into Pakistan, uh, had strikes, in, uh, India's had surgical strikes out there. Even the U.S. has gone in and got Osama bin Laden, now Iran has gone in. Pakistan not actually been able to defend itself from any of these strikes when they were actually happening. So would that be some of the perspective that you would keep in mind when interpreting this from an Indian point of view? Yes, and you know, the, again, it's very interesting, this uh, spat between the two countries. Historically, in Shah's, till Shah's time, Pakistan, Iran was Pakistan's biggest bilateral donor. And it was Iran which provided strategic depth to Pakistan, not Afghanistan. In 19, during 1965 war, Pakistan Air Force planes were shifted to, to Iran. So if you keep this in uh, perspective in mind, you know, it's very uh, strange what Pakistan is doing. Their claim is based on two things, violation of sovereignty and killing of uh, citizens. Pakistan has ceded vast tracts of territory within the country to various terrorist groups. We are aware of it. Americans have been talking about it. And Pakistan actually used Iranian help during Shah's time. Iran provided huge Cobra attack helicopters to kill Baloch nationalists. So, you know, it's a long background. But coming back to the current situation, there is Pakistan is in in a major financial crisis. IMF extended a three billion standby facility in August last. This is going to expire in April 2024. Pakistan's financial situation today is worse than what it was a year ago. It has already slipped slipped into a debt trap. Pakistan federal government's share in revenue of $6.8 trillion are less than its debt repayment, which is $7.3 trillion. This is a classical definition of debt trap, where you have to borrow more to pay existing debts. So on, on that particular point, when it comes to the IMF and from Pakistan's economic condition, there could be two possible ways of interpreting this. Uh, looking at it strategically, Pakistan is obviously critically dependent on China to bail them out. Iran is becoming increasingly close to China. So do you think this will be diffused by China stepping in to try and play a role saying you're both friends of ours? That's what the Chinese statements are saying. You're both friends of ours. We'll, we'll try and help you. China does not want two of its strategic allies to actually be in a state of warfare. Is that how it plays itself out? Or alternatively, Will Pakistan use strikes on Iran as an occasion to sort of tell the U.S. and Western countries that, look, we are fighting Iran, you need to help us, you know, bail us out when the IMF loan comes up? Which of the two scenarios do you see actually playing themselves out, or both? You know, the Chinese have been very stringent with their money. And though they are Pakistan's biggest bilateral donor, 
they do not want to go in alone they have made it very plain to pakistan that they want this within the framework of imf because imf conditionalities is a way of exercising financial discipline on that country which everybody else has has uh, failed to do in the current context and otherwise also pakistan knows imf is controlled by the west by america so if you keep the west asian perspective the current west asian perspective in mind uh, this timing helps pakistan to be seen on the right side of the angels and present a bill to them come april which is hardly two months off so those are possible ways that all of this could play out for pakistan now just what is your own assessment given what you know about iran uh, and pakistan of course do you see any chance that this could escalate into um, all out open hostilities and open conflict between iran and pakistan uh i do not think this is going to escalate into a shooting war in fact both sides are already talking about uh, dialing down the tensions and you would have noticed that both iran and pakistan said that their respective killings have their attacks have killed their own citizens this is a way of you know heading off a uh, a uh, 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 next round of retaliation and uh, so i think this is going to uh, going to the tensions will keep simmering on but they will not escalate into a major a major war all right thank you so much for joining us and that's all we have time for on this episode of the india story but we'll be back again next week with all the big headlines coming out of india and the big experts to help you understand and interpret whatever is happening in the world's fastest growing major economy that's it for now goodbye